so i think here we have with us the first for the first talk is jyotishka he is a committer at apache spark project currently he works as data engineer at data weave the topic of the presentation is python plus spark lightning fast cluster computing please welcome jyotishka okay uh thanks guys uh thanks guys for coming here am i audible uh this one uh now am i audible no this time can you guys hear me this this one yeah yeah hello 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 yeah okay uh thanks guys for coming so uh this is my first pycon and uh, the first pycon uh, talk that i'm giving so the the talk is on python plus uh, spark uh, a way to do lightning fast plus computing uh hello hello so at the end of the end of the talk we'll have 5 minutes q a session uh, please raise your hands one of the volunteer will reach out to you and then you can ask your question thank you hello 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 yeah i, I think you can hear me now yeah uh, hi everyone uh, thanks for coming here uh, i am jyotish ka I work as a data engineer in a company called DataView. I'm also a committer to Spark project. So the topic uh, talk is uh, Python and uh, this time, yeah. So the topic uh, the topic of this talk is uh, Python and Spark, uh, which is a way of doing uh, cluster computing at a lightning fast pace. So Spark is uh, actually a big word that's going on. so it's uh, some some people call it a hadoop killer so uh, before i uh, go on let's do a show of hands first uh, people who are familiar with hadoop map reduce just just raise your hand first all right all right Th that's a good number and people who have heard of spark before coming to this presentation great great so uh, so if i had to uh, describe spark in one sentence that would be it's an in memory cluster computation framework for large scale data processing see i have uh, i have emphasized on the word in memory because that's what makes it different from traditional hadoop map reduce paradigm because uh, spark uh, leverages uh, the memory that you have in your uh, in your server or in your cluster and uh, you can lo load data in your memory and do iterative processing there so uh, with uh, with uh, with time uh, how times are going uh, memories are becoming cheaper and cheaper now servers are standard with 16 gb of ram and if you have 10 of those uh, servers in your cluster then you have 160 uh, gigabytes and that, that that's kind of uh, a lot of ram for doing processing so the paradigm had to ha had to shift from doing a traditional batch processing uh, that that currently hadoop does and doing uh, and uh, going more towards uh, in memory uh, computation so some facts about a part it was in 2009 in uc berkeley uh, it was started as an academic research project but it gained traction and it became more popular and popular so it went into apache incubator last year and uh, earlier this year it uh, it was graduated from the uh, apache incubator and it's one of the most popular project on apache right now so when i made this uh, uh, slide there were around 290 contributors on github and uh, last i checked there are 307 so within uh, 
less than a year, the number of contributors has gone really high, and uh, this uh, this has uh, become one of the most popular Apache project of all time. So, uh, Spark code is developed using Scala, which is a, a functional programming language based on JVM, and it uh, it also comes with uh, Java and Python APIs, and also uh, so contrary to popular beliefs. Uh, Spark is not meant to replace your Hadoop. So if you have a Hadoop cluster, you can just install Spark there. Spark can go there and sit quietly and help you with data processing. So a um, lot of distributions right now come with uh, Hadoop pre-installed. Uh, so popular distributions such as uh, Cloudera or Hortonworks or MapR now bundling uh, Spark and uh, the other, uh, other uh, softwares that come with the stack uh, with their distribution right now. So the, if you download latest uh, Cloudera uh, distribution, CDH or Hortonwork distribution, uh, you, you will get Spark and you can play with it. And also uh, there has been a lot of benchmarking on Spark. So um, one of the benchmarks shows that it, 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 can, it can be up to 100, 100 times faster than traditional Hadoop MapReduce. And uh, when you are processing in memory and if you are using disk, then it can be up to 10, 10 times faster. So who are using Spark? So you, uh, this is a limited list. There, there is a full list uh, in their website. And if you can see that they're all the big guys are using Spark right now. Uh, there is Alibaba, there is Amazon, Yahoo is there, eBay is there. Um, uh, a lot of companies are currently uh, were, were experimenting with Spark last year and they have currently moved to uh, move Spark to their production. And, uh, and uh, one of the companies, Databricks, they, uh, this company was founded by the people who actually created the Spark. So they are uh, building a cloud solution using Spark. So let's hear a few conceptions that people have around Spark. So the is that you, you need to know Scala or Java to use Spark. Uh, 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 the re uh, Spark is built using Scala. That doesn't mean that you have to know to use it. That, that's, a, that's a false misconception. There is a, a pretty good and pretty stable Python API available and all the Python functions are, which are there in uh, for Scala or Java, they work in Python also without any latency. One more misconception is that uh, there are not enough documentation or example codes available for you to get started on Spark. That's not also true. So uh, whatever example that's available for Scala or Java in their website, or in their GitHub repository, they are the same. Uh, uh, the same example is also available in Python. Some of them uh, I have put there myself, and there are a lot of uh, example codes available. There are a lot of uh, uh, blog posts available. There are a lot of uh, videos available. Uh, there has been two Spark summits in uh, one in 2013 and one in 2014. So there are a lot of videos uh, which shows that how people are using Spark in production. Uh, some of the Indian companies, a lot of the US companies are using Spark. Right now. So that's also possible. Uh, one of the misconceptions is not all Spark features are, are available for Python. That I'll say that it's uh, false because um, we have uh, a machine learning library, MLlib. We have uh, full SQL support using uh, as Shark, but that has been integrated into the Spark uh, ecosystem, and now it's called Spark SQL. Missing is uh, Spark streaming. So how do you process streaming data uh, which, which are coming real time and you do some real time computation? That, that's available in Scala and Java right now, but uh, the current version, uh, the stable version is 1.1. In 1.2, we are uh, releasing Spark streaming in Python. So that's a work in progress. All right, so uh, let's get started with PySpark. So what's PySpark? PySpark is a Python API for Spark that's been written using Py4j. Py4j is a wrapper which, which can talk to JVM. And it provides an interactive sh shell for you. So when you run, I'll, I'll show you in the in a demo that when you run PySpark, you can either write a standalone program or you can use the shell, and uh, you uh, you can process data from the shell itself. And also, it, the uh, good thing is that uh, you can integrate with your uh, IPython, IPython shell, or IPython notebook, and you can do interactive processing with it. And also, uh, writing uh, code in PySpark will lead to two times to ten times less code than standalone programs. That two times is for Scala program and ten times is for the Java program. So, uh, and it, uh, currently it has full support for Spark SQL that was previously known as Shark. And uh, as mentioned, the Spark streaming is coming in. in that. Who can benefit from from PySpark? So Spark has a lot of use cases. A lot of pe uh, many people are building their uh, uh, their data pipeline using Spark right now. 
so uh, architectures like lambda architectures and all which are uh, which are quite popular uh, right now so many people are actually including spark for their uh, real time computation or batch processing or uh, or things like that and um, but for specially for spy spark so there are certain class of people who can greatly benefit from it so they are called data scientists so data scientist is uh, one of the buzzword uh, these days so um, uh, spy spark has a very good uh, uh, machine learning library that's ml lib that can also leverage the in memory uh, cluster computation and iterative data processing there are a lot of uh, statistics libraries available there are um, almost all ml libraries available uh, for classification clustering uh, recommendation regression and all these things also a uh, good thing is that um, in your python program you can integrate um, spark with uh, uh, existing packages uh, like numpy or matplotlib or uh, or, uh, or pandas even for uh, data wrangling and for visualizing your data so let's say you have to process hello yeah so let's say you have a uh, 40 gb uh, wikipedia dataset that you want to process and you want to do sub second queries so what you do is you you load the data into memory you uh, you do some processing you do some data cleanup data wrangling using spark and use your uh, tr uh, traditional uh, matplotlib or pandas to visualize your data so it's as simple as that and also uh, for um, so uh, machine learning uh, programs tend to be iterative in nature so you have to load the data and you have to do uh, multiple iterations on it so that was not uh, i mean that was difficult in traditional map reduce paradigm so the, i'll show i'll show it to you later uh, but it's it's uh, since the data is already in the memory you have cached it in the memory so you can reuse the data again and again without having to load it uh, back and forth from the uh, from your disk to memory and memory to disk okay so this is interesting so how spark uh, differs from traditional hadoop map reduce paradigm so this is a very common picture that you have seen um, this is a a, a map reduce architecture so you load the data from the disk it goes into a mapper then it goes into a shuffler then you do reduce and then you uh, write the what, whatever you have processed back to disk and in in between you keep re uh, reading and writing from the disk because uh, the idea for map reduce was that the uh, data should not come to code code should come to data that's why uh, you you do a lot of uh, writing back and forth from disk and it's a programming paradigm for batch processing and uh, by the way you achieve fault tolerance is uh, you replicate the data in uh, one uh, in uh, n number of data nodes and also for if you want to uh, use some high level uh, 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 high level frameworks like pig or hive you, if you want to process your data then it will run uh, once uh, one separate map reduce program for each uh, query that you process so what's what's different in spark the difference is when you uh, you load the data once in ram you you load the data into memory and you keep it there until you are done with it so you don't have to write it back to disk again or for if you want to do any kind of uh, operations map filter reduce anything you don't have to write it back to disk you can keep it in memory as long as you like and you can process the data uh, in in any way and uh, the good thing is so if the data is too uh, so you you might say that i have let's say i have 16 gb of ram and i have to process 100 gb of data what happens then so uh, it will fit whatever it can into memory uh, this will be spl uh, spilled into disk so whenever it it has to compute uh, with the whole data it will take it back from the disk and it will uh, work like a normal app reduce also uh, <clears throat> uh, like i mentioned that it can be integrated with ipython shell or ipython notebook or standard python shell so you can do it, uh, interactive processing so uh, in your shell you can uh, you can process data you can see the output right there you put it into some other collection you put it into uh, you run some other computation on it it's it's become interactive and also uh, the uh, data set is represented uh, as rdd rdd is an abs uh, data abstraction uh, from uh, in the in spark i'll, I'll explain uh, and the rdd actually takes care of the fault tolerance using something called a uh, lineage graph so what's rdd rdd uh, stands for resilient distributed data set so it's a read only collection of objects partitioned across a set of machines so when you load your data into memory it act, uh, in in a spark context 
it actually becomes an RDD and RDD can be uh, is automatically split into multiple partitions and if you have uh, uh, if your cluster has more, more than one node then it will be sent to multiple nodes for parallel processing and good thing about RDD is since uh, you know how RDD uh, how RDD uh, one RDD was computed you can actually rebuild it if you if one uh, chunk of data is lost let's say one node goes down what do you do uh, you can recompute the data back without losing any of the information and also RDDs can be cached in memory so uh, by default it doesn't so when you are done with it it discards from the memory to save space but if you want if you want to persist it in the memory you can do that you can um, cache it and you can use multiple MapReduce parallel operations and uh, I'll explain why, why RZ, RDDs are called lazy because once you load the RDD it it doesn't do any any kind of computation it just stays there it will start computation once you do some uh, processing on it once you do some transformation or action on it otherwise it will just stay there so here is an example so you load one uh, you load one text file from hdfs and uh, this sc is uh, is a spark context you use um, and it's gets stored in a lines so lines becomes an rdd and you can do multiple operations on it so you can do a flat map on it then after the flat map is done you can do a map on it after the map is done then you can do a sort by key on it and you get the sorted count so what happens see in the in the diagram below so what happens is you have an hdfs, HDFS file so you apply the flat map function on it it becomes a flat mapped rdd then you apply map on it it becomes a mapped rdd so uh, and you and you do sort by key it becomes a sorted rdd let's say the map uh, this mapped rdd uh, goes away and the that the node of which contains that mapped rdd goes down what happens so you know how the mapped rdd was computed right so it was computed using that map uh, that lambda function uh, from the flat map RDD so spark can recompute this data without having you to uh, load it back or using replications because you can't really replicate in memory right because memory is limited and also memory is kind of ex more expensive than disk you can't keep adding uh, terabytes of memory in your cluster so uh, it won't replicate but it, it has a capability to recompute the data okay so wh what are some of the operations you can perform on an rdd there are two kinds of operations one is a transformation and uh, the second one is an ap action so a uh, transformation means that one rdd gets transformed into another rdd so you can uh, perform actions like map or a filter or a sort or a flat map and action means that you are done with your rdd and you want to write it back to disk or you want to get some data or something on it from out of it so you do an action so uh, as some of the actions are reduce or uh, count or uh, collect or save to your uh, local disk so i'll show these examples one by one so first one is a map so this is how you uh, define uh, um, I mean create a spark context this was in a spark uh, older uh, versions so new examples I'll show you in the live demo uh, so the, the idea is simple so you create an RDD by uh, uh, using the parallelize function on the spark context what it will do is it will load uh, those three uh, strings into the RDD and it will uh, apply that map lambda function so what you do is you do the count uh, the I mean it's a simple example so you do the uh, you do count uh, the length of the string and you uh, and you emit it back so um, that uh, collect function will is an action so uh, it actually gives you back the data to to the std out from a from an rdd okay uh, second one is a flat map so flat map is like uh, you So uh, next one is filter. Filter is simple. So if you want to, from an RDD, if you want to apply a filter function to filter some of the data back, so you apply the filter. So I have a list of uh, uh, list of integers, and I want to get the only the integers which are uh, even. So I do I use a lambda function where I do a module on it and uh, collect the data only where uh, that uh, that lambda function satisfies. As simple as that. 
so this is uh, this is an example of uh, um, an action on you do on rdd so you do reduce so let's say you want to uh, do a sum of 1 million integers you uh, you uh, you create the list uh, which is stored in the num underscore list and then you uh, uh, perform the reduce operation on that rdd and you use the operator add so it gives you back the 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 total also you can do similar way you can count suppose you want to count how many words are there in a text file so what you do is you split the lines into different words then you flatten it and and as simple as that you count the number of uh, number of elements are there in that rdd and also at the end you can save the data back to your hdfs or your local uh, uh, local computer so what you do is you load that uh, Uh, you load the you know, whatever file is there in your hdfs in as an rdd you you split it uh, you do you flatten it and you use a save as text file uh, uh, and you mention the output directory where you want to save the text file right so uh, let let me show you uh, some demos actually uh, that will actually make things clear so is is this visible should i increase the font size okay This, is this fine? Okay. Yeah. Is this fine? Yeah. So uh, this is how this is how you showed. Uh, I mean, start a, a a demo. You start with word count always. Uh, you uh, so so what I do is uh, from uh, uh, in line four, I uh, import the Spark context from PySpark. and i create a, a spark context with um, with an app name that's called word count demo so you you name your app and uh, then in the next line what you do is uh, so you supply one uh, one text file that you have in your local machine and you load it as an rdd and um, then you do a filter on it Uh, so you uh, so that filter works as you want to remove the all non empty files uh, not non empty lines from the text file i mean all the blank lines and after that uh, for all the lines which are not empty you do a you flatten it by uh, splitting them into uh, uh, sm small strings and then you perform i i don't think uh, wait okay so in line 17 um you first perform a map on it because i want to compute the uh, top 5 uh, words according to the frequency the, you perform map on it you emit it as a the, each word as uh, the word and a value 1 and then you uh, reduce by the key where uh, the the key becomes the frequency and uh, and the word is uh, as a, a second parameter and uh, see that i have done a sort by key so this will since the frequency is the key now so it will it will sort based on the key and that false mean uh, means that it will do in a descending order if you don't mention anything it it will automatically assume that it's true which is which means that it will sort by ascending order that's why you mention false and it and you at the, at the end you do a word count dot take take is also an action it will take top 5 uh, the uh, the num the integer you mention in that parenthesis it will take that uh, those many numbers of uh, elements and show you to you in your std out okay so how do you do this uh, okay let me i guess it's fine ah uh, okay so you run it as pi spark and and one uh, sample text file i have gotten from uh, project gutenberg so it will show a, bun a bunch of status messages and um, it it's starting some uh, http file server and it's computing and it will show you the output in the std out wait Okay, so he here is the output. So it shows a job. Uh, here it shows that the job is finished, and the job took two seconds. That's that's okay, right? Because it's a local machine, and um, it shows that the top five words and and the frequencies also. 
so the, because i did not remove the stoppers it will show the stoppers but uh, but you get the idea right okay uh, also i i would like to sh uh, so i ran it using uh, pyspark so pyspark is not really pyspark so there is a uh, there is a uh, script call spark submit so when you are submitting a job to spark you use this uh, script and you uh, if you are running any python script or javascript or scala script you use this spark submit to submit the job back to spark and uh, i have just created an alias so that it becomes it i, I don't have to type it every time all right <coughs> uh, so next example so this is a simple uh, uh, log processing suppose you have a big bunch of http log okay so one thing i should mention is so uh, this uh, the examples i'm showing it's it might seem uh, really uh, simple examples because i'm not because since i'm running on local machine i'm not uh, really testing it with a lot of data but the good thing about is uh, this is you can actually um, so i'm if i'm running on a 1 mb file or 10 mb file or 100 mb file and i'm using this script if you have one terabyte file or 10 terabyte file you can say, uh, use the same script and you can run it on your cluster and it will depend on the how uh, how uh, powerful your cluster is it, it doesn't change anything the code remains same so all the uh, all the actions or transformations you apply in rdd it becomes same no matter how big you, big your data is you you just have to um, uh, it depends on your uh, how uh, big your cluster is and how powerful it is okay uh, so second example is um, Lock, simple log processing i'll just go through it quickly so again you create a, a an app that's log processing demo then you get the uh, files from the uh, as a command line argument and then you find out the how many post requests have been made so um, so you do, uh, you filter the lines which contains post uh, cap in caps post in it and you also find out how many 200 requests has been made how many valid responses has been uh, so you also filter out the lines which have 200 in it and then you print it in the std route i'll just i'll just quickly show it so <coughs> all right the job is finished um okay so here it shows that number of post requests are this th uh, the number which is given uh, uh, interesting thing is see this um so here uh, you are doing two operations on uh, on this rdd so first is num finding the number of post requests and then the second is number of finding the number of valid responses so um so if you see here that it it gives you the number of post requests has been made then it triggers another uh, a transformation and action on it then it's somewhere here it gives you back okay here and here it gives you back the number of uh, how many valid responses have been okay um i'll quickly go through a third example so this is a uh, example for logistic regression so it's uh, one of the popular machine learning technique for uh, for classification so this example it deals with binomial logistic regression not the multinomial one so uh, okay so uh, you uh, you can uh, so i as i was uh, telling you that you can use numpy or any of these uh, existing python uh, packages available so we are using numpy here because it's fast um, we are uh, importing Py, uh, spark context from pyspark as usual and also we are using uh, we are uh, in importing something called label point because you have to label each of these points uh, we are using a random data set and there is something called label point for labeling all this uh, each of those feature vectors and also we are importing something called logistic regression with uh, gradient descent that's available under pyspark.mlib.classification so see a uh, label point is under regression and there is one in under classification there are similar packages for clustering there are similar packages for recommendation uh, so what you do first do is uh, you parse the point so you have a text file and uh, so the text file looks something like this it's it's messy but uh, what you do is you first clean up the data you parse and you also use a uh, and you get the feature vectors for each point and you uh, 
and you uh, return them as a label point object. After that, you start your Spark context, and then um, you take the number of iterations also, and um, then you create the model by training the uh, b training the, those uh, feature vectors uh, with uh, this train method that's available under logistic reg regression with SGD with the number of iterations that's been given as default. So uh, by default, the number of iterations is 100, but uh, in the demo, I'll give uh, something lesser than that. And it will finally give you the, the hyperplane uh, weights and intercept value. Okay, so it has a dependency of on NumPy because uh, if you want to do some uh, MLlib and so we have kept NumPy as there to do faster processing. NumPy is just a dependency, you don't have to import it or I mean that if this code had, uh, this example had NumPy code, would it just work out of the box? No, uh, 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 sorry, I didn't get you, what? Yeah, I, I'll get back to you on this. And, uh, Okay, uh, I'll, I'll need just one minute. So the final example is a quite interesting one. How to do SQL queries uh, with on uh, uh, with uh, Py, PySpark. So uh, so you import uh, you uh, we imported Spark context, and now you imp import something called as SQL context from PySpark.sql. So you create a demo. And there is a, a simple JSON file called people.json. It looks like this. It has name and their age. And um, what you do is, so here in this line 16, you do the print schema. So it will uh, it will find out the, what the schema is, and it will print it on uh, and it will print on the SD out. And also, you uh, next what you do is you register it as a table. So you give the name as people. You can give something else also. And then you perform this query. Uh, select name from people where age greater than equals to 13 and age less than equals to 19. Just like uh, you do SQL queries, as simple as that. And it will give those uh, name uh, of the people who are teenagers. So let's let's run this. <coughs> yeah, uh, almost done. So if you can see here, it has printed the uh, the schema as uh, we use a print schema uh, function on it. So there is one uh, edge which is integer. It has inferred automatically and also name which is string. And uh, this can be nullable because we did not mention it explicitly. And at the end, uh, it has uh, printed this number of, uh, the, oh, sorry. So it has printed the name of the uh, the people who uh, matches those uh, the SQL criteria we have given. So it has printed on the SD out. So it's kind of difficult to pack all these things into a uh, and half an hour talk session. So there are more uh, more interesting things you can do with uh, Spark and special with PySpark. Um, so let me get back to the slides. So uh, if you want to uh, contribute to SpySpark, so uh, you can submit a pull request uh, on GitHub. Uh, th uh, there has been a lot of contributions in the last six months. And uh, we'll expect that you, uh, you also contribute uh, back to the project. And also, if, uh, if you use and you uh, find a bug, you can report on the Jira. And you can also join the Apache Spark mailing list. And uh, these are my con uh, contact details. That's all. Yeah, thanks. Uh, any questions? <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll, I'll put it on my GitHub repository and I'll also submit the link on that funnel uh, proposal I've given in the comments. I'll give it, I'll give it that. Yeah, sure. Okay, just just speak up. I can hear you. I can repeat the question if you want uh, to the audience. So most of the 
of the stuff you were talking about, like regression, yeah. those are time series stuff, right? So, so those those dip really depend a lot on iterative prospects, for loops and stuff. Yes. So, what, have you ever thought of uh, doing OpenCL back in? Because OpenCL is built for iterative stuff. Yeah, but uh, see, uh, see it. Uh, what happens in um, it actually goes back to the Scala program that's given. So it uses that Pi4j gateway, and it actually calls that uh, Scala uh, code that's written, and it passes all the parameters there and gets back the output. And so I, I'm not really sure if OpenCL is con uh, is uh, compatible with uh, Scala and those all these JVM framework. Yeah, is, yeah. It, is it because OpenCL, op OpenCL. Uh, is actually pretty portable. There's portable OpenCL too. Okay. So, and also there's something like CUDA for GPU. Yeah. And CUDA also has a Java backend. Yeah. JQDA. So mm -hmm. I was just thinking like th this stuff has to deal with so much in like parallel stuff. Mm -hmm. So why don't why don't we have a CUDA backend so parallel stuff becomes so much easier. Th that's that's possible. So also we, what we can uh, so one one of the feature is you can deploy on multi-core uh, processor. Yeah. So, uh, and if you want to uh, de uh, leverage the uh, the existence of GPU in your cluster, um, I don't I don't know if that w uh, someone has started the work, but it will be definitely interesting. But uh, it's it's not there because yes. it's just a year old project. Yes, I I'm, I understand, but mm -hmm. I'm just I'm just curious, and I'm I just want I w I want to see OpenCL and CUDA support in this. Yeah, def definitely, definitely, uh, if it's possible then. So uh, how does uh, this integrate with this? Yeah, how does uh, Spark integrate with NumPy? So uh, all these machine learning functions, it uses uh, NumPy okay. as backend. So it's one of the dependency. So it's, uh, it's a dependency only in building uh, Py, uh, the MLlib module, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, if you're compiling uh, PySpark, I mean from from the source, right. you need to have uh, a NumPy uh, in your machine. Okay. What about SciPy or other some some other uh, something else in the stack which also depends on NumPy, like pandas? Say. Mm -hmm. Now uh, I I don't think. Uh, MLlib depends on pandas, right? No, no, it only no, depends it on NumPy. Yeah. But pandas also depends on NumPy, so in a similar way, we can also integrate yeah, you can, pandas. Uh, you can mash it. them up in your code and you can use it. Uh, okay, so basically, having any NumPy dependent code in your uh, in whatever file you submit, in whatever yeah. job you submit, mm -hmm. will just work as expected. If you have a NumPy installed, that's all. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, how does the Sorry? How does the Okay. Uh -huh. So uh, streaming is not really supported. If you are asking about streaming, it's not yet supported in PySpark, but we are uh, bringing it in the next iteration, in the next version that's re being released. <laughs> but it's it's there for Java and Scala. That's it. So guys, if you have any question, I'll be around. Just.